May I welcome you to the sixth lecture in the 1965 Science Lecture and Discussion Series. We are very fortunate to have with us in this uh, presentation a gentleman uh, that received a majority of his schooling here in the state of Indiana, even though he is a native of Illinois. Uh, he did attend Howe High School in Indianapolis, and uh, his, he received his B.S. and M.S. and Ph.D. degrees from Purdue University. He is specialized in the field of heat transfer and fluid mechanics. In 1959, he joined the Allison staff as a member of the uh, director of research staff in the capacity of the system planning engineer. He was project manager of the Allison Colliery Fire Call a strategic space system study completed early during 1960. During 1960-61, he directed the Allison Nuclear Rocket Study, uh, which was under a Air Force NASA contract. Before joining Al Allison, he worked as a preliminary design engineer and a West weapons system planning engineer for the Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Department of General Electric. He has also worked on the staff of Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory and the Ramon Woolridge Corporation. He has spoken to many groups on the topic which he's going to present today. Dr. John L. Hartman. Thank you. It's real fine to be here this morning. I was very impressed with your beautiful auditorium when I uh, arrived. I was unaware that such a large auditorium uh, was here at Ball State. The topic of the nuclear rocket engine is one which has been very close to the, my heart for a number of years. Although I must say before discussing the nuclear rocket engine, at the present time, I am merely an interested bystander in this particular type of work. <clears throat> what I plan to discuss this morning is why is the nuclear rocket engine being developed? What is it? How does it work? And what will we be able to accomplish when we have such an engine? In the process, I will discuss the current status, the program, and the future uh, schedule of the program. The nuclear rocket engine is used to propel a vehicle in space. The first slide, please. Could I have the first slide, please? While well, waiting for the slide, there it is. You didn't have to wait very long. <laughs> the nuclear rocket engine in this slide, you can very uh, hardly see it. It's located on the lower right-hand side of the slide. The large part of the vehicle would be a hydrogen-carrying tank. The upper part of the vehicle would house the payload and various instrumentation. Also illustrated in the slide are indications of how the uh, vehicle would be steered without moving the main nozzle in itself by utilizing small nozzles, pardon me, nozzles that are located at the top of the rocket engine. Before discussing the thermal rocket engine, I would like to reflect upon the nuclear propulsion program. The next slide illustrates four major projects that have been funded uh, quite extensively over the last 15 years. The first project, which is referred to as the Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion, 
I was focused upon developing a reactor, coupling it to a jet engine, and providing propulsion of unlimited duration. Various approaches were worked on. The program uh, was actively pursued for some 13 years and early in 1962 was canceled. The second project, what is referred to as Pluto, this again is, was a project, I should say, that was focused upon coupling a nuclear reactor and a ramjet propulsion system. Uh, a ramjet, in case you're not too familiar, is a system in which you take in air, you're moving at a very high speed, this air is compressed and heat is added and then the air is expanded through a nozzle. The heat addition part on this particular program would use a nuclear reactor. Again, this project has been canceled. So, two up and two down. The Orion project is probably least known of the four and probably the most exotic of the four. This project was uh, focused upon utilizing nuclear, really small bombs, to provide propulsion. The scheme uh, is to throw a bomb out when it gets a certain distance behind you, to detonate it. The impulse from the bomb is then absorbed by the vehicle and provides a tremendous acceleration. This at first seems uh, very remote, you know, at least when you first start thinking about it, but there are some good engineering bases to consider such a, a means of nuclear propulsion. Such a system uh, would obviously have to be considered for uh, only for very large vehicle applications, extremely large with respect to those that we're talking about today. The last area is the one that I'm going to focus on for the rest of the discussion, and this has been coined many terms. Uh, here I refer to it as a rover project. Uh, names such as Kiwi, Nerva, are other terms that are used to identify the nuclear thermal rocket project. Before we leave nuclear propulsion in general, I did want to give you some measure of the amount of effort that has gone into these projects, and a good indication of that, I think, is the amount of money that this country has spent. The next slide, please. We see that as far as trying to adapt nuclear propulsion to aircraft, uh, approximately a billion dollars has been spent. The Pluto program, about a fifth of that magnitude. The Orion, which is the bomb concept, has received rather low funding for obvious reasons. The rover project uh, has received slightly over $750 million to date and is being funded at a very aggressive level at the present time, namely about $150 million per year. <clears throat> and we'll talk more about what is being conducted on the program today. I think it's important to reflect a little bit as to why all the interest in coupling nuclear energy to propulsion. The reasons for this, I think, become much clearer when we examine the amount of energy that's required to propel us from Earth to such places as the Moon, uh, perhaps Mars and Venus in the future. Here I illustrate the amount of velocity gain that's required to, in the first case, to 
put a vehicle in orbit about the Earth, and here we see some 30 to 41,000 feet per second velocity gain is required. Uh, if you look farther down the list, and let's take a planetary mission, Earth to Mars, land and return. Here we talk about requiring 130,000 feet per second velocity gain. Now, I would like to use the blackboard and define how this velocity gain is achieved and give a little meaning for the future part of the discussion. So if I could have the light, please. In order to gain velocity, we find that we must expel a material and convert the thermal energy into kinetic energy. Excuse me. Can you hear me? I'll continue. We must convert thermal energy into kinetic energy, our motion. And this is done through expanding hot gases in a nozzle. The overall rocket propulsion <coughs> velocity gain can be expressed as follows. The change in velocity is proportional to G, gravitational constant, times a term that we call specific impulse. I will be discussing this term in more detail later. It is really these two terms together is really the measure of the velocity at which the gas is leaving the nozzle of the rocket engine. It is also a function of the amount of propellant that one has in the vehicle. This term is written as the laws of the initial weight of the vehicle divided by the weight of the vehicle after the fuel has been burnt dry weight. So the difference between the growth and the dry weight is propellant weight. Now it is obvious from this equation the higher IST one can achieve, the greater delta V you are able to obtain. Hence, as we'll see later, the importance of the nuclear rocket engine. I might as well also discuss what is IST? I said it's a measure of the velocity issuing from the nozzle. It's also proportional to the temperature at which these hot gases are divided by the molecular weight of the hot gas. So obviously you're interested in higher temperatures and lower molecular weight gases. This is why we talk about hydrogen. Hydrogen has a molecular weight of 2, which is extremely low and very fine in order to achieve high specific impulse. The last equation that I'll put down here is how do we translate the specific impulse into thrust? We all hear these rocket engines and discuss in terms of they produce so much thrust, so many pounds of thrust. Well, the thrust is equal to the IST times the flow rate. This is the number of pounds per second in the case of the rocket engine of hydrogen that we're putting through the engine. In the case of, excuse me, <laughs> readjust my volume here. In the case of the chemical rocket engines which are being utilized today, we see characteristic uh, specific impulses of the order of 275 with possibilities of going to uh, slightly over 400 seconds. If we translate the specific impulse of let's say 275 into the delta V that we could achieve in a single stage chemical rocket vehicle, we see figures of the order of 20,000 feet per second. The nuclear rocket engine, which is in the development stage today, offers in the near term specific impulses of the order of 800 seconds and this can be translated into delta v's of the order 
of 50,000 feet per second. Now, why is this important? Well, if we reflect to the previous slide that we had and consider again the Mars mission requiring 130,000 feet per second, we see that a chemical propulsion system coupling to the chemical uh, propellants in a vehicle stage would require something like seven stages, seven times the 20,000, in order to be able to develop and deliver a total of 100 and over 130,000 feet per second whereas the nuclear can do the job with three, each being 50,000 feet per second. The importance of cutting down the stages, are, I think, speaks for itself. Uh, some of these uh, vehicles that we talk about and carry on calculations for such missions as the Mars become, when restricted to chemical propulsion, become almost like the Empire State Building. And the cost involved in building a vehicle of this nature uh, become gigantic. Consequently, uh, any reductions that we can make by utilizing energy more efficiently is of tremendous interest to the space program. Okay, I think uh, we'll conclude that we have established why and what the, uh, the nuclear rocket engine can do as far as performance. Let's look at a characteristic nuclear rocket engine. Uh, the engine basically comprises of a series of components. Uh, if we start in the lower left-hand part of the illustration, we see a turbo pump. There it is, it's focused now. Temporarily. The turbo pump function is to uh, transfer the liquid hydrogen from the tank to the engine and also to pressurize this liquid hydrogen to the order of, say, a thousand pounds per square inch. This liquid hydrogen that has been pressurized is then ducted, if we could follow the top, uh, that slide is very hard to see from here, I hope you can see it better from out there. If we follow the top uh, piping all the way to the rear of the rocket engine to the nozzle, we see that we introduce the liquid hydrogen at near the uh, tail end of the nozzle in this particular illustration, and then use this liquid hydrogen to cool the nozzle in order that indeed it does not melt and remains uh, structurally rigid. And then we utilize this uh, somewhat higher temperature uh, hydrogen, which uh, uh, during the process of cooling the nozzle becomes a gas. We use this to further cool the outside portion of the reactor, which uh, houses, uh, in this particular case, uh, the control drums that regulate the reactor power. The flow then uh, comes into a plenum at the front of the reactor and then into the reactor core itself where this gaseous hydrogen would be heated to the value of the, say, 4,000 to 5,000 degrees Rankine, or taking 500 off of those figures Fahrenheit. Surrounding the reactor core and the reflector and control area uh, would be a pressure vessel. So these are the principal components of the rocket engine, and the last component that I did not mention are what is referred to as the attitude control nozzles. Uh, the hot gas, hydrogen gas, which is utilized to drive the turbine, which in turn operates the compressor. Uh, the exhaust from that turbine is then ducted to these nozzles and can be utilized to provide what some people refer to as power steering, making sure that the minor corrections in the attitude or the, the orientation of the rocket is properly aligned with respect to its trajectory. I think it's important to reflect a little bit on the key problem in the rocket engine, and it's obviously the reactor. We're talking about a very compact reactor and a reactor which is operating at very high temperatures which poses many problems, both from a heat transfer and a structure standpoint. 
I think if we reflect just a second on and take a few numbers here to give some meaning to what's occurring here, and I'd like to use a blackboard in this illustration. If we have a rocket engine producing a million pound thrust, better get my notes so I put the right numbers down. In order to produce one million pounds of thrust from this engine, the heat that has to be created by the reactor is some number like 19 million BTUs per second. A BTU is a measure of thermal energy. Uh, I've never made the experiment, but a long time ago in one of the physics lectures that I attended, uh, the instructor said that a BTU was roughly, if you took a kitchen match, this is a long variety, lit it, the amount of heat that, that match liberated uh, during the time that it burnt is approximately one BTU. Well, this is the amount of heat that's required to be delivered by the fission process. And I think it's rather interesting to look at how much heat does a single fission produce. Now, here we're talking about U-235 uh, with a neutron causing this to fission into two products. And when this happens, various types of energy is emitted. Gamma rays, uh, approximately two and a half neutrons are liberated. These fission products have kinetic energy. Most of this energy is absorbed in a very short distance within a solid and appears as thermal energy. So if we translate from a single fission how much thermal energy occurs, we see it's a very low number, 3 times 10 to the minus 14 BTU. This is one fission. So consequently, to get a number of this magnitude, uh, some 10 to the 21 fissions per second must occur within that reactor. 10 to the 21 is a very hard number to even begin to conceive uh, physically. Uh, it's a tremendous number of events that are occurring. I think that it probably would be instructive to look at some of the problems that are involved in designing reactor cores for a, a rocket engine application. The next slide, I show what the objectives are, and again, I point out that we are seeking very high specific impulses, and again, this means high temperatures and low molecular weight. I previously discussed uh, how we get the low molecular weight. Obviously, in any rocket application, we're interested in light weight, and this poses severe problems upon components that must operate not only with high temperature environments, but also many of these components are faced with very, cryogen very low temperature environments too. For example, the liquid hydrogen that is utilized in this engine uh, its temperature would be of the order of minus 430 degrees Fahrenheit where it is contained in the tankage. Also, these engines must be recycled, they must be reused, and obviously must be designed with the minimum of hazard associated with it. When we translate some of these design objectives into the limitations that we face, well, first of all, we, in order to have a, what we refer to as a heat transfer type rocket, we must have this heat being generated in a solid, and the solid remain a solid. Consequently, uh, we're faced with uh, the melting points of uh, materials, and we see uh, four listed here. The material that's receiving the majority of the attention today is graphite, with uh, a second amount of emphasis going on the tungsten. Working fluids, well, I think that speaks for itself, the interest in hydrogen. 
Uh, it's considerably lower molecular weight. In fact, if we could dissociate hydrogen, uh, we could get down to molecular weight to the order of one. Ammonia uh, is a possibility, water is also. But for all intents purposes, the working fluid is hydrogen. And this is what's being pursued today with quite vigorous program. I think I'll bypass the other comments here and conclude this particular part on the fact that at Los Alamos, the uh, major reactor work is going on on graphite. The Westinghouse uh, Corporation is also working on graphite reactors. And at the Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, they're carrying out work in the tungsten uh, concept. I think it might be interesting to get a little physical feeling for uh, these rocket engines. And here I present a tabulation of data, which I will not discuss in complete detail. I'd just like to call your attention to the first column of numbers, uh, where I say uh, a thrust of 50,000 pounds. Uh, this principally is the engine in the development today. This is the engine which perhaps some of you read a week or so ago in Time Magazine, uh, they carried out a destructive test on. Characteristically, to produce this 50,000 pounds of thrust, uh, we'd be pumping something like 70 pounds per second of hydrogen. Uh, the amount of, of uranium that would be in this reactor would be something like 250 pounds. The size of the reactor might be of some interest. Uh, it would be something like uh, uh, three foot by four foot. The temperature, as indicated in the last column, uh, would be of the order of 3,500 to 4,000. Now, if you ask the question, well, instead of a 50,000 pound thrust, how about uh, a million pound thrust? And the last set of numbers uh, illustrate that. I think it's of interest to note the fact that the reactor itself uh, still is rather small. Here we see that a reactor principally six foot in diameter and six foot long uh, would be capable of producing sufficient thermal energy for this type of a engine. In the next uh, slide, I show a mock-up of the engine which is under the development, which is referred to as NERBA. Uh, you get a feeling for the size of this engine, noting that the nozzle part of the engine is some 22 feet long. Here we see in this engine that the liquid hydrogen is not brought to the end of the nozzle, but brought about one-third of the way down the diverging part of the nozzle the remaining part of the nozzle can be cooled by radiation. I'd like to skip the next slide if I could and go to the one after that and examine the reactor test schedule. Uh, <clears throat> here I would only like to point out that there had been a series of react rocket reactors tested. Uh, this testing uh, really uh, was uh, started in the early 1959 and during the 62 time period uh, received considerable more emphasis in its fact that due to the fact that the facilities required for the testing of these reactors was created and expanded that permitted a more vigorous test program to be prosecuted. Uh, in November of 62, uh, during a test, they had a problem. The reactor came apart. Uh, excessive vibrations occurred, and the graphite structure of the reactor fractured, and pieces of the reactor spewed out the nozzle. Approximately one and a half years went by, really, back at the design board. Uh, and evolving the solution, engineering solutions, to the problem that occurred. And we see that a series of what is called co-flow tests were conducted uh, middle of 63, 
cold flow is referring to the fact that the reactor is not brought up to temperature, but uh, is only tested with uh, coal hydrogen gas being put through it. It's interesting to note that the design was substantiated and full power was demonstrated in August of 64. The Kiwi program, which is the Los Alamos program, has been stopped. Uh, they are convinced that the technology on graphite reactors is established and now the engine development program, which is referred to as NERVA, is moving at a rather rapid rate. The test of NERVA A2 occurred in September and a considerable number of tests are scheduled for this particular year, including the one that I mentioned earlier, the, what is referred to as the transient nuclear test that was a destructive type test to establish the amount of hazards that would be involved if a malfunction did occur. The information that has been released on this test is that it was very successful and substantiated their previous calculations. I would like to skip the next three slides. I, this time I'd like to direct your attention to the overall nuclear rocket system program. The program is really comprised of two parts. Now, I've talked principally about the nuclear rocket engine portion. Obviously, this engine has to be coupled to a vehicle. The vehicle under design is referred to as RIFT, Reactor In-Flight Test Vehicle. It is in the R&D stage. Uh, this vehicle could be ready by early 1970, if so required. At the present time, very little effort is going into the vehicle part of the program. The majority of the effort is focused in the engine part. Now, we've already discussed NERVA, the fact that it's a 50,000 pound thrust type engine. And as I've said, it's in the engineering testing part of the program now. The Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory is now turning their attention to a higher power graphite reactor concept, which is referred to as Phoebus. Its power would be approximately five times that of the NERVA engine. It is in the early research stages, and they anticipate carrying out reactor tests in the next three to four year time period. This particular type of uh, reactor, uh, great stress is being placed upon achieving greater power density. Basically, the overall dimension of the Phoebus reactor would be identical to the NERVA. And we earlier discussed this as being something like three foot in diameter and four or five foot long. Uh, obviously, if the power is increased by a factor of five and you have the same volume, uh, you've got five times the power density. And this poses a greater magnitude of problems in heat removal, which is a key problem in the nuclear rocket engine system. These, the NERVA engine and the vehicle could be coupled and a nuclear rocket system uh, could be operational by 1975. Such a stage, a nuclear rocket engine stage, uh, is not be receiving strong consideration for our lunar or Apollo type program but is focused upon the planetary and more ambitious space missions which are in the study stages today. In summation, I would like to point out that the development of the nuclear rocket engine will provide us the capability achieving space travel at a far lower cost 
than has been formerly realized possible. The low cost per flight arises out of the continual reuse of the vehicle and the low fuel burn-up features of the reactor. The achievement of low-cost space travel capability will have a great impact upon future space missions. I think it's becoming more apparent uh, than it was a couple years ago that economics uh, represents the strong position, or I should say the strong, strongly influences uh, what we are going to accomplish in the exploration of space. And I think it goes equally as well that any nation that achieves a nuclear rocket spaceship will indeed at the same time achieve a space capability which far overshadows any of the achievements to date. I thank you.